In the battle against various illnesses that have ravaged humanity, smallpox stands above the rest. The illness was able to kill the vast swathes of the population all around the world, before being defeated in a breakthrough treatment. Through a concerted effort, the human race was able to eliminate the illness, though not before millions had perished in absolute agony. In today's video, we will cover the symptoms of smallpox, how it was able to spread, and how it was ultimately wiped from the face of the earth. Smallpox is a viral illness, usually spread through the air and close contact between two or more people. Those infected only become contagious once the first sores appear in the mouth and throat. From there, the virus spreads through coughs and sneezes. Once the virus is inhaled, the patient will experience a 12-day incubation period. During this time, they are not contagious, but the virus takes its time in making its way through the person's body. On the 13th day, a patient will begin to feel as if they have had flu, with headaches and fevers, often with some vomiting. Around the 14th day, a person will begin to notice the sores and rashes so often associated with smallpox. These sores are usually first seen in the mouth, but once these sores start breaking down, rashes start appearing all over the person's skin. It starts on the person's face before spreading to the extremities and within a day, the rash will cover the entire body. During this time is when a person will be at their most contagious. These sores will soon fill up with pus forming hard round pustules which start to scab over after a week or two. These scabs soon fall off leaving a person marked with scars and marks on their skin. And once all the scabs have fallen off, that is when a person is no longer contagious. In terms of the odds of survival from smallpox, it would first depend on which strain one had contracted. The mortality rate from variola minor is approximately 1%, while the mortality rate from variola major is approximately 30%. Very often with smallpox, complications arise in the respiratory system with conditions such as bronchitis or pneumonia. The rashes and sores can also pave the way for bacterial infections. It is common for patients to be left with pockmarks, often on the face and with damage to the eyes, resulting in blindness. And in some cases, a person can be left with encephalitis, that is, swelling in the brain. The origin of smallpox was likely from exposure to livestock. What cannot be denied is that wherever smallpox found itself, it quickly took hold over the populations. Various outbreaks through history have been attributed to smallpox, including the Plague of Athens, the Antonin Plague, and the Siege of Syracuse. Smallpox was able to spread along the various trade routes and was spread by the armies that fought during the Crusades and spread throughout the colonial settlements. Smallpox proved to be particularly devastating to the indigenous populations of the Americas. In 1520, with Herman Cortez's conquest of the Aztec Empire, smallpox found its way to the populations who had never experienced any disease like it. As a result, as many as 75 to 90 percent of the Aztec populations perished, making it that much easier for them to be conquered and destroyed. In North America, the Native Americans succumbed to smallpox at an alarming rate, with mortality rates as high as 90%. You may have heard stories of the European settlers purposefully handing out the smallpox infected blankets. There was only one recorded instance of this during his siege at Fort Pitt in 1763. Blankets and handkerchiefs from the fort's hospital were handed out to the native forces, with the desired effect of spreading smallpox. Whether or not this was actually needed, however, is unlikely, as by this time smallpox was already embedded in the native populations. Despite there being such massive detriment to so many, for those who survived there was one positive. The survivors were often sought out for various professions as those who survived were immune to smallpox. These survivors would go on to work with patients suffering from smallpox, or be sought out to work with children as a way to reduce the risk of the disease spreading. Many attempts were made to deal with smallpox, with the inoculation of the uninfected in what is known as variolation. This involved dried smallpox scabs being blown into the nose of an uninfected person, or 
pus from a smallpox patient would be inserted into a person through an incision. They would then go on to contract a mild case of smallpox. After recovering from the illness, the patient was immune to the disease, however, the procedure did carry a level of risk. Around 1% of those who were inoculated in this manner would die and they would still be contagious. What's more, the variolation would require smallpox to exist. It would never be a way to completely rid the world of the disease. It was not until the 18th century that a safer and more effective method was developed to stop the spread. During the 18th century in the United Kingdom, as was the case in many parts of the world, smallpox had become as an accepted part of life. Even though the population had become somewhat resistant to the disease, it still claimed the lives of around 100 people per day. Which, if you account for population growth, would be around 600 a day with today's population. In Gloucester, where there were many dairy farms, there were farmhands and milkmaids who remained immune to smallpox. This was discovered and expanded upon by a doctor named Edward Jenner. He would struggle to inoculate those who had been exposed to a form of cowpox usually contracted through milking infected cows. Jenner then set about working out which strain of cowpox would provide immunity to smallpox. He collected pus from a milkmaid infected with cowpox and set about inoculating the son of his gardener, an eight-year-old child named James Phipps. This was done by cutting the child's arm and rubbing in the pus, resulting in James contracting a mild case of cowpox. This confirmed that cowpox could be spread from human to human, not just cow to human. Once James had recovered, Jenna exposed the child to smallpox, and as hoped, James was immune. Jenna named his method vaccination, from the Latin for the word cow, vacca, in homage to cowpox. Jenna's vaccination process was quickly dismissed by many doctors and practitioners of variolation at the time. Many thought it was repugnant that a disease originating in cows could be used to protect humans. Some early opponents even made claims that Jenna's process resulted in children making animal noises. Though this of course is likely a sign of their youth and not of any hybridization between human and cow. Others, however, did see the benefit. The likes of Elizabeth Fry, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Thomas Jefferson saw the value in Jenner's work. Jenner was adamant that his method would spell the end of the smallpox virus, making the bold claim in his 1798 papers. But in less than 200 years, Jenner's prediction would be proven correct. The vaccination of smallpox soon began around the world, starting in Europe but soon spreading to the Americas, Canada and India in the early 1800s. By the 1850s, most of the industrialized world made Jenner's treatment required by law, with imprisonment, for those who refused. By the start of the 20th century, through a combination of quarantine and vaccinations, smallpox was all but eliminated from first world countries. In 1967, the World Health Organization set the goal to completely eradicate smallpox from the entire world. At this point, the number of smallpox cases each year was thought to be around 15 million, mainly in Africa, India and South America. This was to be achieved by vaccinating every man, woman and child in the areas where smallpox was still prevalent. Teams of doctors and nurses were sent all around the world, no matter how dangerous the regions may have been. Whilst isolated outbreaks still did occur, these were largely well handled and the virus was not able to spread further. The last person to die from smallpox was a woman named Janet Parker, having become exposed to a sample at a lab in Birmingham, England. Janet died on the 11th of September 1978 following complications from pneumonia. The researcher in charge of the lab, Professor Henry Bedson, took his own life, even though to this day, it is not entirely clear how Janet was infected. By 1980, the World Health Organization officially stated that smallpox had been eradicated. One of the deadliest diseases that had long blighted the human race had been defeated, bringing true Jenner's belief that it was possible. All that remains of the smallpox virus are just two samples in two laboratories, one in Siberia and the other in Atlanta, Georgia. We very often focus on history involving individuals responsible for countless deaths on this channel. 
but for a very welcome change, we can state that Edward Jenner is the individual likely responsible for the most lives saved. Smallpox ravaged countless lives and claiming the lives of anywhere between 300 and 500 million people in the 20th century alone. And without the tireless work of so many, it would still be a constant threat to human lives. It is truly a testament to what the human race is capable of achieving, should we realise the bigger picture and focus on a collective good.